And, uh, you know, it's always crazy when you, uh, you announce that you're going to preach on untold stories of Christmas because everybody thinks you're going to get some weird doctrine, right? But don't worry, I'm going to stay very biblical this morning. And, you know, I'm not going to introduce any new heresies or unorthodox Christmas, Christmas stuff, okay? So, but God's good, amen. So let's just begin, and we're going to read out of a very familiar passage of Scripture at this time of year. Let's turn to Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Hallelujah. Now it came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all were proceeding to register for the census, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. That's an important thing to note, okay? In order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child, And it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. Here's your sign, right? You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger, and suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And it came about when the angels had gone away from them into, the, into heaven that the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in haste and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Praise God. Now, that's a really, really familiar passage of Scripture. And how many, I mean, like this week, even in our chapel at Global Harvest Christian School, we took several days and we watched The Nativity Story, a movie from about 10 years ago, very well done. Um, And, you know, we've all, probably all of us have seen Christmas pageants. Many of us have been in Christmas pageants. I mean, Emily played baby Jesus when she was a newborn right, it's her, her debut, uh, so we, we know the story so well, uh, but how many of you know the more familiar we are with a biblical story, the more difficult it is to view it outside of the way it has always been understood, okay, and so even over the centuries, things have added to our meaning of the text that sometimes are not there, Okay, there was actually a, a story in a book that was written about 200 years after the birth of Jesus, um, and it actually has given us some things that we think are traditional Christmas story that aren't there. And so I want to look a little bit at some things this morning. Don't worry again, you're not going to lose your Christmas pageant this morning, you know, <laughs> um, but there's some things I just want to look into, okay? So first of all, where was Jesus born? Okay? We know he was born in a manger. You know, some tradition says that uh, Mary and Joseph were uh, out alone, 
that they were in a cave or a barn of some sort. Um, one tradition is even that Mary was actually entirely alone when she gave birth to Jesus, okay? But the reality is Jesus was probably born in a house, okay? And the reason why is, let's think about this for a minute. Now, we all think we have this picture of Jesus, of Joseph and Mary arriving in Bethlehem. It's night is falling. She's in labor. They run to the inn, and the innkeeper's like, there's no room. Get out of here, right? You guys have all seen that, okay? The reality is that um, Joseph was from the family of David, so he was basically a royal. It was a big, big deal if you were the lineage of David. Now, we don't get that in America, right? Because, you know, anybody watch The Crown? Anybody watch that Netflix series, right? Uh, it's a pretty good show. Um, I give some mild disclaimers. Watch with care. Um, but, you know, Joseph was kind of royalty, he was a descendant, not like, you know, he didn't live in Windsor or anything like that. But we have to understand that in the Middle East, family history, family lineage, and connection to your village of origin is really, really important. So Bethlehem, the city of David, right? If you come into the city of David as a descendant of King David, it's a big deal. So, he would not have been turned away. All right. Oh, my gosh. Am I messing with you? I'm messing with you a little bit. Okay. So, um, <laughs> and no matter what Mary's condition, okay, she, if she had been turned away as a woman about to give birth, it would have put, brought unspeakable shame on that village. Okay, so the reality is when you look at uh, traditional houses in the Middle East, okay, basically, and you can look at multiple scriptures, they've, they've existed since the time of Mary and Joseph up into the 20th century, but traditional Middle Eastern homes in villages had two rooms. Isn't that exciting? Right? Um, they had a family room where... Everybody did anything, everything together. They all slept there. They had their meals there. And they also often had a guest quarters, which sometimes is also called the prophet's quarters. And sometimes that was either at one end of the house or it was on the roof, right? Remember the story of Elijah? The woman would put him in her prophet's quarters that she created for him when he would come through, right? So... But at one end of the house, there was also a room that was a few feet lower. It was blocked off by timber, okay? Um, and at night, they would bring the animals in from outside, okay? And they did that because, first of all, in the winter, it provided warmth, right? If you're living in a culture with um, no heat and air, right? Warmth is a good thing, and it also prevented people from stealing your animals. And so they'd bring their animals in at that part of the room at night, and, you know, during the day, uh, if they, they just sweep off everything into that area, there was actually an area that they had um, shaped out in the floor between uh, the, an the, the, the family room and the room for the animals so that if an animal got hungry at night, they had a manger. And so they put hay there, and then the cow, instead of bothering, does anybody have a, an animal that bothers you at night? Right? So you want to keep that animal calm, right? We make our dogs sleep with the kids because, yeah, and they love it, right? They love it. But they had a manger that the animals could eat out of at night rather than bothering them. So if Mary and Joseph show up, and, you know, it's really interesting, too, because if you look back here, it says that, um, let me find it real quick, sorry, that, um, sorry, you guys, that while they were there, right, 
And it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. So they'd probably already been there a while. They didn't come riding into town like, Oh, Joseph, Joseph, find me a place, you know. And do you always think of Joseph as this completely inept, bumbling guy running from door to door? Oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. No, that wasn't Joseph at all. So they arrive in town, very known from the family of David in the city of David, and they would have been welcomed into a home. However, the thing is, because everybody's going back for this census, guess what? The, the prophet's room, the guest room, there was no room. So where do they end up? The animal room. So y'all, there probably really were animals there right in the night and uh, so I'm not messing anything up okay but Jesus was actually probably born and the village would have made sure the people in the house would have made sure the women that Mary was very taken care of because if they didn't there would be shame on that village so doesn't that make God seem actually a little better because have you ever thought, boy, here they are in the middle of nowhere, in this nasty place, having baby Jesus and nobody was there to take care of them? That's really not scripturally accurate. God made provision for Jesus to be born. Now, he wasn't born in a palace, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but he was born in a very clean, comfortable place well taken care of by a village of Joseph's family that wanted to make sure everything went well, right? And we'll see more proof of that in a minute. Now, sometimes even when we read this story and we read the account in Matthew of the same account where the kings, the, wi the, the wise men show up, it says that they came into the house and fell down and worshipped him. Now, some people have took that to say that maybe it was a year or two later when the wise men showed up, but I think they were there on the scene the night Jesus was born with both the lowliest of low, right, the shepherds, the bottom rung of society, and the wealthy and the rich all coming together to worship the king of kings. And I think... See, I'm not messing your theology. It's actually, aren't, don't you, don't you th aren't you glad that God was so faithful? That even though, yeah, it was a difficult situation and Mary probably had to endure persecution and all those things as basically an unwed mother, but God in his goodness continued to meet them and care for them. Hallelujah. So let's keep on going. Now, what about that whole thing about there was no room in the inn? Now, the Greek word commonly translated inn, you know, in Greek it simply means a place to stay. And it's translated numerous ways. And even actually later in the book of Luke, it's translated as a guest room or an upper room. Okay, when Jesus goes to have his uh, his last supper with his disciples, um, that uh, it, it talks about that they met, and it's the same room as um, the room as the word for the inn, where there was no room in the inn. So actually, the prophet's quarters was full. The guest room was full. Okay, so Jesus was born in the stable area of a home because the guest room was full. All right, we're good, right? You guys can still keep your nativity scene. All right, you don't have to do away with it. It works, all right? Now, for a moment, you don't have to change your Christmas decorations because they're theologically inaccurate. Whew. Dina is like, I just decorated this week, and I am not changing it, right? Yeah. Now, let's talk about who were the shepherds, okay? And these guys were lowly and uneducated, 
okay? They lived with the sheep. They're out at living with the sheep. And um, so they were, um, even though it was not a bad occupation, but the rabbis, okay, and the rabbis are a whole different story, right? They were considered unclean by rabbinic traditions. Now, isn't this interesting that the first people to hear the message of Jesus were those who were at the bottom of the social scale in society, okay? And we read the Christmas story, and we're like, oh, this is so beautiful, right? But who would the modern-day equivalent of those that are at the lowest rung of society be? Let's think about this for a minute, okay? Um, the homeless, right? <laughs> I'm afraid to ask what Dean said. Cowboys? Cowboys? Oh, my gosh. Maybe so. I'm taking care of their herd, okay? Um, who else? Who else would you... Cowboys. Cowboys, according to Dean. Are <laughs> Alan's offended, right? <laughs> he's he, he's out of here, right? <laughs> but the homeless, who else? Who else maybe would be considered at the bottom of society? Prostitutes? Absolutely. What about illegal immigrants? Right? Whoa, yeah. What about maybe addicts? Okay. What about people in prison? Right? And that's, that's who the angels announced the birth of Messiah to first. Right? So, you know, in our American mindset, I don't know, you know, we have to think, who would Jesus probably appear to first? The Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys, probably. Oh, it's not the worst record, right? <laughs> Sorry, you Cowboys fans, right? <laughs> now, think about this. You've, yeah, you've got the lowest in, in society, and the angels show up, and they announce, hey, Christ is born, Messiah has come, and you need to go see him. But if you're truly the Messiah, if, if, you, if that child's truly the Messiah, and you're told to go see him, how do you think that's going to work for you? So here you are. Let's say you're a homeless person. An angel appears to you and says, Hey, Christ has been born, Messiah is here, and he's at... Um, Dornick Hills. You need to go check it out. And they're like, well, I don't know if we're going to be welcome in Dornick Hills, right? If I'm going to show up smelling like the street, okay, to come see Messiah. Uh, and, and, and you know what the angel said? Here's your sign. Don't you love that? Here's your sign. And he says, you're going to find Messiah wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. You know what that meant to the shepherds? You're going to find him wrapped up like a poor baby in a poor place. Don't worry. Here's your sign. And so they were like, oh my gosh. He's one of us. Right, So from the very beginning, it was no wonder that what we would call the common people, i.e., the Walmart crowd, no. Uh, <laughs> right? I'll make it easier for you. The Target crowd, right? <laughs> They're upper middle class, right? Upper common people uh, would feel welcome to come see Messiah, right? They knew, right, that he was born for all people. Yeah, right? And so they went to see who this Messiah was. Now, normally if they'd shown up without an invitation, it would have been like, okay, you're an unclean shepherd, right? You might spread RSV to my baby, <laughs> right? So you can't hold him, right? Right? You, have you been fever-free, right, for 24 hours? 
okay? You've been with the sheep. They might have foot and mouth disease, okay? But the shepherds had an invitation to come see baby Jesus. Now, it's even more interesting if the shepherds had shown up and Jesus was, and, and you know the cave thing? Some people say he was born in a cave. That really could have been true because sometimes houses may have been in a cave or started in a cave, so that's possible. We don't know, right? But if the shepherds showed up as lowly peasants, because you guys don't understand, hospitality is a big, big deal in the Middle East. You know, if you read the Old Testament and somebody, a guest shows up and they're like, okay, let's kill a cow, right? You know, there's some crazy stories. Oh, all these men are trying to break in. Here, have my daughters, right? That's extreme hospitality, right? I mean, it really is. Do y'all read the Bible? <laughs> That's how much you take care of your guests, right, and protect your guests. I'm, okay, sorry, kill that rabbit, right? But, uh, <laughs> but if the shepherds had shown up and Jesus was in unclean conditions, you know what they would have done? They would have packed Jesus up and said, we're taking you to our place, and we're going to take care of you. But obviously they came, and they found him in good condition because their honor would have demanded, we're going to take care of this baby, and you're going to come live for, with, stay with us till y'all are better, right, Till you can travel. So Jesus was very, very well taken care of, right? And the shepherds, it says, they went away without Mary and Joseph and Jesus, right, and, and proclaimed everything that they had seen. Not only about Messiah, but that baby Jesus, he's taken care of, right? And so, you know, you had the, the lowliest of the low, amen, the outcast of society became the honored guest at Jesus' birth. And angels sang to the simplest and the lowest of all, amen. Hallelujah. You know, it's, you know, some of the greatest moves of God that are happening in the earth right now. They're from in some of the, the most unlikely places, right? People like Nick and Rachel Billman, Shores of Grace, reaching out to the prostitute and the orphan, and they're seeing a move of God. And uh, Roland and Heidi Baker ministering to, to orphans and and, and people that have been cast aside. And some of the greatest, greatest moves are happening. And yet, don't forget that Jesus also came to the wealthy, right? And, and that at his birth, not only were there shepherds, but there were wise men, amen? And so let's talk about the wise men for just a moment. And let's turn to Matthew chapter 2. Another account of the Christmas story, okay? Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. All right? So these guys probably came, right, uh, from Arabia, okay? They were probably Gentiles from Arabia. So you've got both the lowest person from the Jewish culture worshiping, but you've also got Gentiles who are Arabic who know nothing about Jesus. They know nothing about the covenants of God, but they've suddenly been invited in, right? Suddenly, you understand with Jesus, suddenly everything changes. And suddenly, and we're going to look at this a minute, everything shifts and begins to shift from Jerusalem to a child, right? And suddenly the nations are invited, okay? And so you've got 
these guys worshiping at the birth of Jesus together. And, you know, these guys may have been, um, you know, we don't know, were they astronomers? Were they astrologers? I don't know, but they didn't know anything about God, right? Maybe they were in some occultic things. We don't know, okay? But God called them out of darkness to experience Jesus, amen? And so, you know, uh, he's calling people from every part of society, from every culture, uh, and, and all to come and to worship uh, the Son of God. So, Jews and Gentile both worshipped Jesus at his birth. Now, I want to look at another passage of Scripture, okay? Let's turn to Isaiah 60, and this may be a little bit of an unusual passage of Scripture to talk about at Christmas. But you remember one of the gospel writers, I don't remember if it was Luke or John, and they were like, you know, man, all there's so much about Jesus that it wouldn't be contained in books, right? There's so much that we could talk about, and yet we're just going to give you this, this right here. And so we've got this passage of Scripture, and, and again, suddenly everything begins to shift. But let's read Isaiah 60, and we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 6. Arise, and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you, and nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Okay. Now keep in mind as we're reading this that how many of you know that sometimes when you enter into prophetic revelation, you know in part and you see in part. Okay. That's why sometimes when we see things, when we hear things, when we have prophetic revelation, sometimes you just need to process that. Right? I mean, I was th seeing some things even in worship this morning, and I'm like, I'm not ready to talk about what I'm seeing yet because I have to see more. I have to press in more, but I was seeing something uh, that was strategic, I believe, to the next season that we're going into, okay? That's why Jamie and I weren't talking about where we were going to eat lunch, right? In worship, I was like, this is what I'm seeing. I don't know what to do with it. So... The prophetic is a lot like that, okay? Sometimes you're seeing things and you're like, okay, I need to sit on this for a while, right? Uh, I'm hearing something, I'm seeing something, but I don't know what to do with that. So that's kind of off the subject of the sermon, but it's, it's good to know as a gathering of prophetic people. You may hear and see something, but it may not be the moment to share it, right? It may not be a word yet. Okay, but sit on it and rest on it, okay? And sometimes you have an uh, immediate, oh, yeah, okay? So, but prophets, a lot of times we'll see things through our understanding and through our perception. And so Isaiah did that. And he's getting this word and he's having this vision and he's thinking that it's for Jerusalem and the city of Jerusalem. Now, it's very interesting because as you read through I think it corresponds very closely to what we call the Christmas story. All right? So let's keep reading. Let's, let's just start reading again. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. So... In the Christmas story, is the glory of the Lord arising on Jerusalem? It's arising on Jesus, the Son of God, Messiah. Suddenly, everything starts shifting, right? And it says in ver at verse 3, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see... 
They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar, and your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you, and the wealth of the nations will come to you. A multitude of camels will cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, who are Arabic nations, and those from Sheba will come, and they will bring what? Gold and frankincense, and will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. Hallelujah. So suddenly, what Isaiah saw now, I think there's a greater fulfillment that of, that's, that's yet to come, right? I think that speaks of the role of the church, the role of the gospel, right? The bride of Christ, that nations are called to come into the bride of Christ, to come into the church. But at this moment, it's not about Jerusalem anymore. And maybe that's what Isaiah saw, right? Now, we know that Isaiah had a lot of prophetic words about Messiah, but suddenly... There's this shift from Jerusalem, and everything opens up. And all the peoples of the earth have an invitation to come in. Amen. And so the hopes and dreams of all the years, right? You sing along, right? The hopes and dreams of all the years suddenly get shifted from Jerusalem to a child born in Bethlehem, right? And Luke tells his readers, where did the glory of the Lord shine? The glory of the Lord shone around a child and not a city, amen? And to the child came Arab wise men from the desert on camels bringing gold and frankincense. Shepherds visited the child and not the city. Okay, now, I still want to go to Israel someday, right? I think, you know, I still want to go to Jerusalem. I still want to go on one of those journeys and honor what the Lord has done and see all the things he's done. But suddenly, it's no longer about one nation, right? Suddenly, it's no longer about Jerusalem, but it's about the gates have been opened to all peoples. And we don't understand that, you guys, because we've, we've grown up, many of us, some of us not, but many of us grown up with grandma in church, grandpa was a deacon, all that. We're Americans, right? You know, but there's this reality that we're no longer excluded. We have an invitation. The nations have an invitation. The glory of the Lord is shining on a child And you can even read, and this is, you know, there are multiple interpretations of this. But if you read the end of the Bible and um, what happens to the new Jerusalem, right? It's actually coming out of heaven, right? There are a lot of interpretations coming out, you know. But it could be that child coming out of heaven as a gift to the earth. Not the old Jerusalem, but a new Jerusalem of the church coming upon the earth. Now, I don't want to mess with anybody's theology about Jewish roots and all that stuff because I think there's a place for that, right? I think we can learn a lot from that, but the glory of the Lord, it's not on Jerusalem anymore. Right? It's on a child, right? It's on this gift, like the heavenly bride coming out of uh, out of heaven, um, not necessarily for the end of time, but at this moment he's come upon the earth, and his glory is shining upon us. So our hopes and expectation. You know, because you read through the Old Testament and everything, everything is about the, the city of Jerusalem. But what's the, what's the emphasis today? Amen. 
It's the child. It's the church. It's what God is doing. So the, the hopes and expectations of that are fulfilled in the birth of a child. So what's our, what do we take from that, right? What do we take from that? So there's an invitation to all the nations, right? And sometimes at Christmas, and I, man, you guys, I love Christmas, right? I could watch a Christmas movie every day, not a Hallmark movie, but, and if y'all like them, bless your heart, right? It's all good. It's all good, right? I've never seen one, so I can't criticize them, right? But, <laughs> but, but sometimes in Christmas, we f- the real message of Christmas is not just that everyone is invited. The nations, God is calling the nations to come and experience Jesus. He's calling everything that was suddenly no longer clean is suddenly clean, right? Don't you love what Jesus did? That in the old covenant, it was like, okay, you can't touch this. You can't eat that. You can't go there because you'll get unclean, right? Now, that doesn't do away with the fact that there has to be morality, okay? But suddenly you've got this child who comes and the unclean get invited in, right? And not only do the unclean get invited in, right, they're equal with everyone else, but Jesus becomes this walking tabernacle of God, this, this, this habitation of the presence of God. And suddenly, when before, oh, you've got to stay away from a leper, you'll get unclean if you go near a leper. Well, what does Jesus do? He's not affected right, by the unclean, but he, he steps out as a habitation, as a river, carrying the glory of God, and instead of saying, oh, I don't want to go near the leper because I'm going to be unclean, right, he says, be healed, right, he becomes this walking, he was, God became manifest in the flesh, and he released the glory of God wherever he went, right? And this river of God that was contained in Jesus, where is it now? Suddenly, it's in us. Jesus said, little children, it's my desire to give you the kingdom. Guess what? You just inherited everything that I had. Didn't he say all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me? Therefore, go and disciple nations. So the reality of Christmas and the Christmas message is suddenly everything that was unclean Spirit of God is resting on you. The glory of God is resting on you. And you can go and release what's been given. Right? Now, sometimes we forget about that. Right? Especially this season where you have a list. And your list just keeps getting longer. Right? Your phone note just keeps getting longer. Right? And I get that. So I'm not putting pressure on you to do anything else except live in the glory of God. Live in the glory, the presence of God. Because there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Who's the city of God now? It's us. 
We're being built and fashioned into a habitation of his glory. The glory of the Lord isn't shining, not that God doesn't still have plans for Jerusalem, but it's shining on you and it's shining on me. We're called to take the glory of God to nations. Amen. There's a call to nations. Nations are coming in. I believe we're in a moment of great, great harvest. Amen. There's a great awakening upon us. Amen. The light of God is shining. So this morning, as you prepare for Christmas, (laughs) some groans from the front row over here, right? Someone lay hands on him quickly. (laughs) Don't forget about what God has done. And like we saw at the beginning, and go and release the glory of God. Praise God. So this morning, I'm actually going to finish a little bit early. It, it, I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. I could feel it. I could feel it. But I commission you today. The glory of the Lord is upon you. Amen. And at this moment, he's shining through. And I I just also just declare that we're moving into new territories in this region. Now, again, I don't completely know everything that that means. But I saw it this morning as we were in worship, right, that there's something before us further that the Lord wants to open up, right? And... I'm praying. I'm not going to talk about it more. But in days ahead, just know that uh, there's an advancement that we're about to go into. I feel it. I sense it. I sense something new that he's about to open up. So put on your, for the new year, put on your intercessory hats, put on your prophetic caps, put on your apostolic shoes, and we're going into something new. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, Father, we want to thank you today for your glory and your presence. Lord, I thank you. Lord, we just thank you for Jesus today. And we take a moment to honor and to love you, God. And in the midst of busyness, to be thankful. In the midst of all these things, to reflect on how good and how faithful that you are. And so, Lord, I pray today, and as we we go into... Uh, activities this afternoon, God, as we go into uh, activities this week and job and so much to do, Lord, I pray that you would just teach us what it means to release your glory wherever we go. And Lord, you've made all things clean to us. And Lord, I thank you that what's on us is going to get off on everybody else. And Lord, that we're going to begin to affect people and places wherever we go because of your presence, your anointing, your glory. And so, Father, we thank you, we honor you, we love you today, and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? All right, so if you need prophetic ministry, uh, we'll have a prophetic team here. If you need prayers for healing, physical healing, we have a physical team here, a physical healing team. And not a physical. (laughs) That's not happening. (laughs) We are not that kind of church, right? Do not turn your head and cough. So, (laughs) sorry. We're dismissed.